Hello and welcome to today's special event, Freedom to Read Roundtable. My name is George Kendall and I am editor and publisher of Booklist Publications. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. All registrants will receive a copy of a resource guide and a link to today's recording in follow-up communications tomorrow. The resource guide was also included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned above. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. Finally, we expect all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates this standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may at the discretion of the organizers be immediately removed. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of the Texas Library Association, Shirley Robinson. Shirley Robinson is the Executive Director of the 6,000 member Texas Library Association, a position she's held since January of 2020. Prior to coming to TLA, she was President and CEO of the Texas Healthcare Trustees, a statewide trade association serving more than 4,000 hospital board members. She also spent eight years in progressive leadership roles at the Texas Healthcare Trustees and the Texas Hospital Association, serving as Senior Director, Education and Programs at the Texas Healthcare Trustees and as Vice President, Education and Governance Programs for the Texas Hospital Association. Robinson also held business development and fundraising, membership, education, and marketing positions at nonprofits, including the Texas Society for Association Executives, the Muscular Dystrophy Association, and the Austin Museum of Art. She received a bachelor's degree in business administration from Trinity University and is a certified association executive. Thank you so much for being here, Shirley. Thank you so much, George. It's such a pleasure to be here as well. And thank you for Booklist's incredible leadership to amplify voices across the country on this foundational issue impacting our profession and our freedoms. TLA is also deeply grateful to Macmillan for their foresight to develop this panel and for demonstrating how a roundtable such as this in any community can spark dialogue for understanding and forward movement to help us all learn and grow from this challenging time. We're proud to share a wonderful range of voices today from across the state of Texas and the country. And while what is taking place here across all library types, school, public, and even academic, feels like it is following the mantra of everything is bigger in Texas, we see the parallels also taking place in so many other states and industries. So at TLA, our hope is that by raising public awareness within our communities, learning from each other's experiences and showing the power, voice and value of libraries, that we will all be stronger on the other side of these unprecedented challenges to our very foundation. So let's not delay. I am pleased to introduce Brian Lopez from the Texas Tribune right here in Austin. They have broken many of the stories that have received national attention and have done an incredible job with their reporting. So Brian is the public education reporter for the Texas Tribune. He joined the Tribune in August 2021 after covering local government at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram for a little over a year. The Star-Telegram was his first gig after graduating from the University of Texas at Arlington in May of 2020, where he worked for the student-run newspaper, The Shorthorn. 
And when not on the job, he's either watching or playing soccer. Brian, thank you for moderating the session today. Good luck to our panelists. Thank you for being here. Brian, the floor is yours. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Shirley. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here and, and to have this thoughtful discussion about the freedom to read. And now we'll introduce our six panelists uh, for tonight. Uh, up first, we have George Matthew Johnson, bestselling author of All Boys Aren't Blue. We have Janetta, a high school junior. Ryan, a high school sophomore. Erica Sanchez, a community advocate and mother. Mary Woodward, president-elect of the Texas Library Association and representative Aaron Zwiener of the Texas House. Thank you everybody for being here um, and taking your time to talk about uh, this issue uh, that here in Texas uh, has been in the headlines in the news since uh, last year and really took off, uh, I believe, in late October uh, when uh, Representative uh, Matt Krause launched an int investigation to several, into hundreds of books, um, uh, whether Texas school, public school libraries had these in their libraries and whether they would violate uh, what's the so-called critical race theory law here in Texas. This has gained a lot of steam, um, a lot of books, a lot of books having to do with race, uh, gender identity, uh, history, and mostly written by people of color have come under attack and removed from libraries. Um, so that's kind of what I want to um, start, of, start off with tonight. Um, if we wanna go ahead and, and before we start off, if the panelists wanna say a little introduction, um, and we'll start off in alphabetical order uh, with Mr. George Matthew Johnson. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is George M. Johnson. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. I am the author of All Boys Aren't Blue, uh, which has been banned in about 18 or 19 different states with criminal complaints filed against me in Florida, as well as the book in Florida, against the book in North Carolina, um, and with currently the governor of Iowa reading a passage of my book on national television uh, out of context. And now they are this week going to try and pass a uh, law to ban, or not to ban the books, but to make it a felony or a misdemeanor for educators or teachers to give my book to a youth, uh, which can be up to one year in jail, as well as a $2,500 fine. Um, next we have Janetta. Hi, I'm Janetta and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a junior in high school um, and I'm an, I run my school's uh, student newspaper. Um, I grew up in um, a predominantly white district. And so um, some of the topics that are coming up as controversial in the news recently have hit a little I guess close to home for me. Um, and I'm excited to talk about this issue. Awesome, up next we have Ryan. Hello, my name is Ryan Sealander. I am a sophomore in high school and um, I'm a first generation immigrant. I was adopted and I was adopted from China and pretty much um, it was kind of a struggle when I was in elementary school to like high school still of like seeing like rep Asian representation and any representation in general of for me so yeah up next we have mary woodard hello everyone i am mary woodard i am the president-elect of the texas library association and my background is in um, school librarianship been doing that for many years and um spent a lot of time this year encouraging librarians um, that are dealing with this issue talking to media, uh, letting them know that we have processes and standards in place 
uh, that we are not putting pornography in school libraries, all of those things. Um, and I'm really happy to be here today to talk about this uh, with all of you. Up next, we have Representative Aaron Zwiener. Hey, y'all, I'm State Representative Aaron Zwiener. I represent a district in Texas just southwest of Austin, uh, where we're seeing some of these fights play out, though not as dramatically as in other parts of the state. Um, I have the dubious honor of seeing this fight in Texas start to unfold on the floor of the Texas House, where it started out with legislation talking about critical race theory, I put it in quotes because no one carrying the bill knows what that is, um, and have watched it expand to attacking books um, representing uh, experiences of diverse Texans. Um, so very interested in helping push back and honored to be a part of this panel today. And then we have uh, Erica Sanchez. Hi everyone, my name is Erica Sanchez, um, she, her, Aya. I am very honored to be here with you all today. Um, representing the other parents who don't get as much media attention. <laughs> um, I, I was a PTA president. I was an educator for 12 years. I currently work for a nonprofit. Um, and I understand the, the educational system. And I also um, understand, obviously, the parent um, perspective in this. And let me tell you, a lot of us do not support all of these um, bans. Um, we support the professionals like Mary who were chosen and they're <laughs> who have gone to school who are literal professionals to choose um, books that they feel that are quality books for our students to read. And um, I have been part of this fight. I saw we saw this fight coming um, over a year ago. Um, and it just started to gain um, traction recently, but in my district, we worked on getting DEI policies. And um, when we started moving into DEI is whenever the um, book band started, um, I guess the sparks began. So now we're in the, um, the heavy part, the pit of the fire, if you will. Awesome. Well, thank you guys again for, for being here tonight. Um, I want to start uh, here with, um, uh, with George Matthew Johnson. You, you, your book, as you mentioned, has been removed and complained against in several states, including here in Texas, uh, from public school libraries. Um, you know, talk to us about you know your decision to, to writing your book and and how it makes you feel that you know something that's supposed to stand for representation and inclusivity and helping others uh, is being you know attacked and you know in some cases criminal complaints are being filed and, and legislation is being passed. Yeah, uh, I live my life by the Toni Morrison quote, uh, if there's a book that you want to read and it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And in writing All Boys Aren't Blue, I wrote the book that I wish I had when I was uh, a teen and a young adult. Uh, I wrote the book that I wish that my parents had when they were raising me so that they would could better understand what it was that I was dealing with and what um, how the navigation of my life as a Black queer person looked a lot different than that of my siblings uh, and even that of some of my cousins. Um, and so, yeah, in writing this book, I wanted to ensure that the generation that falls behind me didn't have to feel the same things that I felt uh, growing up and not seeing representation of myself, neither in TV or in my classroom or in any of the books that I had to read. Um, I always say like we're kind of in like a blueprint generation in many ways and so my generation had to make a lot of mistakes uh, and go through a lot of different hurdles as like one of the the more visible uh, publicly queer uh, generations and so it then becomes on us to make sure that we are handing those next set behind us uh, the tools that they need so that they can navigate these very um, tough spaces but that they can have language and they can have resources and that they can know that they also have legacy uh, in this world and that they exist too. Uh, seeing my book being attacked like this uh, one interview a while ago, they said that I had a lot of audacity to call my book a manifesto, uh, but look at where we are now. Uh, I think I knew when I wrote it, I knew what I was writing. 
I knew the country that I lived in and I knew it wasn't a matter of if my book would be banned, it was a matter of when my book would be banned. Um, so of course, as overwhelming as it is and sometimes heartbreaking as it is to see them attack my story, uh, I was raised by a Southern black grandmother who always taught me, uh, you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. And so I was ready for the moment when it presented itself. Uh, and I'm gonna continue to stay ready for the moments as they continue to attack my book and several others uh, because we truly deserve for our experiences to exist in these classrooms and anywhere else in this world because my people have always existed. Black queer people have been here since the beginning of time. Uh, I'm not the first to have my story. I'm just the first one to be able to tell it and I'm gonna to continue to tell it. All right. Thank you, George. Um, and you know, it's a, a perfect segue here into, um, I wanna ask you know, Janetta and Ryan here, you know, you, you guys are, are on the ground, you're, you're seeing this going, you're in the schools uh you you you've been you've grown up in the texas public school system uh janetta i want to start with you uh tell us about you know what it means to for you as a high school junior or yeah high school junior to see books being you know challenged being banned that you know it might not be accessible to either you or your um peers uh, to go into a library and check a book out um it upsets me because i like in, I really got into reading when I was in middle school and that was kind of my, <clears throat> that was my activity that I could just like get into and not worry about any other stresses in life. Um, and it was a way to see representation um, because like I said, I, a lot of the times I'm the only black person in the classroom um, and that can be isolating sometimes. So um, being able to escape into books that had people like me um, that was helpful for me. And I also feel like um, it just, uh, people aren't taking the needs of students as seriously as they're taking um, their own political agenda or their whatever fear rhetoric they've been whipped into, which is really sad because um, they're losing sight of the people who actually matter here um, mm -hmm. in terms of what books should be available in libraries, which is the students um, and not, you know, every everybody else. Same thing for you, Ryan. I mean, uh, can you talk a little bit about what, what this kind of means? You guys have seen it firsthand, you've seen it in the news, um, but do you feel like you guys are being heard and accounted for here when, when we're talking about you know, what books should be allowed? Um, personally, for me, um, I've been seeing from my school, um, I don't know about other schools, but they're starting to take out books already and silently. And that's the thing that's alarming to me is that seeing these books that are getting taken out and no, like the schools are not telling anybody about it. I feel like it's saying that like our representation, my representation as an LGBTQ plus um, person is um, is just getting cheapened because they're taking it out quietly. Because if, I mean, it's just regardless um, about, regardless about like having like representation inside of the books, taking out something that has a lot of meaning and value to other communities is very like, it's, I mean, it in, like I like my rights to see my representation in our schools, it's unfair for, people to not have that and like and schools to silently take it take it out if that makes sense because um because I feel like if schools silently take it out it's saying that like hey your representation doesn't matter so we're just going to take it out regardless and be silent about it and not tell you and um predominantly my school is very much so, like there's a lot of different cultural ethnicities and races in it so like those books mean like 100% like a lot to those groups and minorities because like predominantly like our group is like 40 50 like um different communities so yeah thank you well, thank you Ryan uh, for that answer um and I want to I want to shift really into you know what what has kind of caused all of this which uh for the past couple of months the past year as you've mentioned it's been a lot of 
parental outcry, uh, specifically on books either being pornographic. Um, so uh, Mary, I wanted you, you're president-elect of the Texas Library Association. Talk to me about the standards that you guys have. How do our librarians vetting books? And is there, you know, explicit pornography in schools? Well, there is not explicit pornography in schools. Um, we have very, um, we have a Texas Association of School Boards provides um, policies for school districts to follow. And there is a, a um, very well-known outline policy, a selection policy for districts to follow. Um, so when librarians are choosing books, they are looking for things that support the curriculum. So it's either a curriculum topic or, you know, part of the curriculum is for kids to learn to read. And so um, to practice reading, you have to have lots of different um, options for kids so that they will, will read something that's of interest to them. Um, we also, going along with that, we also look for things that re reflect the interests, the needs, and the lived experiences of the communities that we serve. So every school library is going to be different based on that student population. And librarians are, are striving to honor that those different diverse communities by selecting things that represent all of the, the students and the faculty that we serve. We, we also look for things that are appropriate to the target audience of the campus, um, whether it's the reading level or the um, Emotional maturity, you know, at the middle school level, we have a wide range of emotional maturity from sixth graders to eighth graders. And so we have to have things for all of those kids. Um, we also, of course, have, we're looking for things that have literary, artistic merit and educational value. So, and my understanding is that for something to be considered pornographic, it has absolutely no educational value. So when something has that value, then it cannot be pornographic. So that's why we say that there is no pornography in school libraries. And then of course, we also look for things that present information with accuracy and clarity. So those are the criteria that we use when selecting books for the school library. Well, when, when hearing all of that, there seems to be a very, very efficient process, a process that all librarians are going through. Um, so, Erica, I want to shift to you for this question here. You know, you're in the board meetings, you were talking to parents, you, you mentioned, you know, there's a loud uh, minority here of parents who are trying to get these book bans. Can you kind of talk about, you know, is this really about, about the book? So what is what is going on down there? Well, from what I've seen in my district, it started, as I stated prior, with um, DEI initiatives, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion. And then it turned into an attack on Christians, right? Because somehow diversity, equity, and inclusion is attack on Christianity. Then is when they brought out, they started reading excerpts from books. Books, mind you, that were already approved from the prior school board um, that we had. They approved it and like two of them are no longer um, a trustee. So we had new people on there. Well, they took that as an opportunity to blame the new people for allowing those books when they were already in the system, right? So these books have, have already been in circulation for a bit, but all of a sudden now they're jumping on these books. And mind you, if you read anything, just one paragraph out of context, of course, you're going to get that immediate, um, you know, shock value, right? <laughs> you're like, what is this? And not to mention that you know, we also had props that were brought to our school board meetings. So we had a very fun NC-17. <laughs> um, we were having, you know, these really interesting school board meetings that included props and words and what have you and books and shock. And, and it was this huge drama. Like you couldn't even make a telenovela the way the school board meetings have been. Well, then it's turned into, okay, ultimately what it is, is not about DEI, is not about book bans. It's about the dismantling of public education. These parents, because it's the same group of parents, right? And unfortunately, these people all go out throughout the nation and, you know, under different names. And they create the same language, the same um, behaviors, and they go to these meetings. And some of these people that come to our meetings, mind you, don't have kids in our district, 
right? Some homeschool, some don't even live in our district. So they, they come to rattle a cage that they're not even a part of. And um, what they want is that school choice. They want money that is meant for all students to go to charter schools, private schools, and that's that's where it that's where this really entails because they attack teachers, they attack librarians, they attack the school board members. Anyone involved with the educational system gets attacked. And so, unfortunately, this minority is what gets all the views, all the clicks, because people like me don't want to be known for anything like that. I don't ever want to be on YouTube for acting crazy and embarrassing my kids, right? So um, unfortunately, those are the people that get noticed. And then within that, we've also noticed that, you know, we have reached out to different authors as well who've been um, attacked by people in our district, and the authors are going through it. You know, as George mentioned earlier, they're going through it. They're getting um, attacks, you know, people are calling, doing threats on their lives. And it's ridiculous. Not only is it professionally, but it also as on a humanity um, level. There's almost like where is the humanity? And unfortunately, our kids are seeing us act this way. Thanks, uh, uh, Erica, uh, for that answer. I know you've been dealing with that down there. Um, but, you know, this, this also goes back into, you know, um, a lot of politicians are using uh, parental rights or terms such as critical race theory to kind of fuel this as well. Uh, we've seen here in Texas, uh, Governor Greg Abbott has, uh, you know, directed the State Board of Education and the Texas Education Agency to uh, take pornographic material out of schools. Um, here with us is State Representative Aaron Zwiener. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what's going on in, in terms of uh, the politics of it all? Is it being used as an instrument to gain more votes? Uh, what is going on behind the scenes? Well, first of all, I want to say, yes, we've had some direction to take pornographic material out of schools, but I want to agree with our previous panelists. There has not been pornographic material in schools. There is some material that has some explicit content, but those are in literary works that have other value and teach important lessons. Um, and so some of that material should be available. It is appropriate for a lot of our teens to be exploring some of those questions. Um, you know, behind the scenes, I I think this has been a way to try and rile up the right wing base as we go into Republican primary season. And, and I hate to make it that explicitly partisan, but it kind of is. We just went through redistricting in Texas and because of populations generally growing in urban areas relative to rural areas, people had to have their districts shuffled around a lot. And that means that um, the average rural Republican member has about 40% new territory in their district, people they didn't used to represent. And so they were all going into their primaries very scared of somebody running to the right of them. And so this is a way for them to stand up and say they're defending kids and they're blocking access um, on these sort of social hot button issues, whether that issue is related to diversity and inclusion um, and making sure we, uh, we have diverse books on a rac racial basis in schools, whether that's um, saying that they're keeping explicit material from kids when really what they mean is restricting access to the stories of LGBTQ people. Those are all hot button issues that work really well with the primary base, despite not being that popular with Texans overall, but it does reach that narrow percent of people that vote in those primaries. Um, and so I think that's what we're seeing motivating a lot of this. To push back, I think we have to have this bigger conversation about why do we have public education? And we don't just have public education to teach people you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. They're also democratizing institutions. They're things that help build us as a society and help us stand together. And we can't do that effectively if our public schools don't represent the full breadth of Texas. Thank you, Representative. Um, I want to go here to, you know, the kind of the impact of this um, and what it means for, you know, public education, right? Um, you know, obviously, uh, George, you know, with, with your book being, you know, removed and, and challenged and all that stuff, can you, can you talk a little bit about what it means, you know, for, for a student, for, for a kid maybe who wants to read that and wants that representation, wants to go check out that book and it won't be there? Can you talk a little bit about what that impact kind of kind of means to you and, and the effects it could have? 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, the effects that it has specifically on Black LGBTQ youth is that many times they often have to live what I like to call the second adolescence into their adulthood, because when you remove materials that teach them about how to get through their adolescence and you remove materials that empower them to to be uh, proud of who they are and to be able to navigate in the identity that they are, they often have to hide their identity. So when you see bills like the Don't Say Gay bill and you see the anti-trans uh, bills coming out, what it does is it suppresses LGBTQ youth until they are able to reach an age where they can live more boldly as the identity that they're in. Unfortunately, what happens though is that they lose a lot of social skills like dating, for instance, uh, like having friends groups, friend groups, for instance, uh, like learning about uh, general health uh, and sexuality. Uh, and and, and they, they miss out on all of that, which means that they go into adulthood almost having to live out those adult years. So it actually sets them behind socially. It set me behind socially, um, you know, and simply not being able to access a text that tells you that you exist. And that tells you that, that validates that the feelings that you are experiencing are correct. They are true, that what you're experiencing is not a phenomenon that is unlike other people who are experiencing that very same thing. Uh, it lets you know that someone else exists in this world like you. It gives you precedent. Uh, and it also gives you heroes. I think we don't talk enough about the fact that these books give you someone to attach to. They give you heroes. They give you a possibility model of someone that you can potentially become. Uh, I grew up knowing who James Baldwin was. I did not know that James Baldwin went through very same feelings that I went through though, because they removed that part of his story. I did not know that when we were learning about the Angela Davises and the Audre Lords and uh, the Zora Neale Hurstons and the Langston Hughes, I knew all about who they were and what their work was. I had no idea though, that they had feelings similar to mine and experiences that I one day would experience too, because they took that part of the story away from them. And so when authors like myself and others are putting that part of the story in the story, and then they try to remove the entire story, you're literally setting back every child who needs to know that these experiences exist and that they have possibility models and role models too in the world. Um, and so again, I think that's why we remain so fervent in our fight to keep these books, uh, especially because you know my book is under attack under pornography and they're literally referring to three pages in a 320 page text. And so when you say, the rest of your ex existence doesn't matter because I feel this topic is too heavy uh, for a child. You're also saying to that child that I actually don't understand what your lived experience is because there is no topic too heavy if a child can experience said topic at that age. And so that is why, um, again, I, I fight so hard for my book to stay in, in these systems because the removal of it could be detrimental uh, to, the, to the health and the growth of anyone who is a, a young LGBTQ youth. Um, and I wanna go to, to Ryan here with this question. Um, you know, you, like I said, you guys are in high school, you guys are in the middle of this, of this uh, almost, um, you know, attack on the public education libraries. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what this kind of means for, for for you and for your peers, um, is there going to be other ways that you can, you know, maybe access these books? Do you feel like, you know, you have your, is your voice being heard in the middle of this? Uh, we hear a lot about the adults. Do you feel like you, you're being heard? Um, I personally feel like out of like the whole situation, it's more like parental control rather than like the actual issue at hand, which is taking books and education away from like students like me, so when we like look into like deeper of like the issues of like censoring books and like the issues of what will happen if this uh, if censoring books will be keeping up and like like taking out books in um, libraries in our schools. Um, personally, for me, um, when I was a little kid, like when I was a little kid, 
Um, I, I lived in a really conservative household and we never really talked about like the LGBTQ plus community. And when we did, it wasn't in like really the best light possible. And then when I joined middle school, I was very much so the odd, odd ball out because like I wanted to paint my nails. I wanted to wear like a pretty pink tutu and all that. And um, I never really had that representation shown in books whatsoever because, because like it wasn't really shown. And I, I lived in Texas when I was in the middle school age years as well. So it's not, it's just not so like the literature in our books that doesn't show our representation, but also like the community that gives us those books. And we can like see like right now, like people are getting affected and people will get affected because if I had, um, if I read in middle school, all boys aren't blue or all those books that had like representation of the main character being a queer person and not because they were getting fetishized just because so happened they are queer I could have that could have changed my whole perspective for me feeling like the odd one out and for me to feel like I was normal and could connect to other characters in literature which like brings on to the point of like other people around me and other people in like high school middle school and elementary school even and um if people have that literature they cannot they can connect to and feel like they're normal and feel like they belong somewhere and um that's the main issue is that like the belongingness of um of reading books like happens to everybody when you pick up a book you want to see yourself and you want to feel the, uh, the person's emotions and what they're feeling and if people are going to censor those books then a lot of people are not going to be able to get in touch with books it will make people like not want to read at all regardless like because now people don't want to read and now if like we take out personal experiences and personal things, no one would want to read books because you can't really connect to it. And I feel like that's the main issue. So, so I think for, for, for you, Janetta, what do you think is, you know, the, the issue at hand here? Is it, you know, is it a lot of politics getting into, into schools? Is it, you know, talk to me about what you think the, the real issue is here. Um, <clears throat> I definitely think, uh, there is some playing politics here. Um, we heard Governor Abbott like talk about a parental bill of rights, but really um, it's not the parents' rights that are in danger here, it's the students. Um, uh, and this issue, it seems like brand new to me because I've only been on this world like 17 years, but I did some research and I realized uh, we've talked about this before, like this one's on the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said students do not shed their rights at the schoolhouse gates. And so um, we have known for a long time that book bans uh, trample on students' rights. Um, they're a big First Amendment issue. Um, and I think the reason why this is coming again, up again, like recently is because of uh, fear, because parents, see the world having a cultural shift the country is changing and they feel like uh, the country they once knew is slipping through their hands and so um they want to exercise control over um their local schools and to some extent i understand the impulse to do that but i also think it's have it's causing way more harm than good um because Libraries, uh, they cater to fostering a love of reading in students and also forming, you know, the citizens of tomorrow. And you need a wide range of books in order to uh, serve those two goals because you have all sorts of students. And so the fact that a student as a parent thinks that they can limit what kind of books based on their own one child um, I think it's short-sighted because um, it's not just their one child who goes to that school, it's everybody. So um, I think if a parent is concerned about the kinds of books that they see in a, their child's children school, they need to have to sit down and have a conversation with their child and um, not limit the rights of all the other students who go to that school. And. Uh... Mary, what, what, what do you think, you know, as somebody in the Texas Library Association, is there anything that can be done here? I mean, uh, it seems, 
you know, that parents have a lot of control right now over what's going on in, in, in libraries. And as well as, you know, we have lawmakers uh, uh, pushing this kind of narrative as well. What, what can, you know, what kind of advice do you have for, for librarians and, and what do you think we can do here? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that Janetta and Ryan just, I mean, it's almost like we don't need to say anything else. They've they said exactly what needs to be said about this topic. But as far as what we can do, um, you know, as librarians, uh, librarians and teachers don't get into to the business of education in order to um, harm the students that they work with. And so uh, we definitely want to partner with parents. But like Janetta said, it is in our policy that we, a parent has the right to, to monitor and um, and limit what their own child reads, but they do not have the right to limit what other people's children read. And so I think getting out there, you know, being aware of what the policy is and having conversations with our administrators and with parents and with students about those rights that they have um, is gonna be something that we can do to just inform people. And also if parents have concerns, all they have to do is come to the librarian on their campus. Um, it is part of our policy that uh, we have in order, in addition to our selection policy, we have a reconsideration policy as well. And we are happy to take another look at something to make sure that um, it still meets all of those selection criteria that I outlined and make sure that it is still um, uh, correct and appropriate for the campus. You know, a lot of times things get outdated and, and we do need to remove them from the library collection. You know, uh, removing things is, is just as much a part of developing the collection as adding things in. And so um, we need people to understand that, that and that there is a policy to be followed. And um, I would love to see our, our parents following that policy and our school boards also following that policy. I think a lot of times um, they, uh, like Janetta said again, they get afraid when um, a parent brings something concerning to a school board meeting instead of following the policy and taking it to the librarian who can actually review that in conjunction with the selection policy. So, so just making people aware of what those policies are, um, I think will we'll, um, go a long way towards um, helping people know how to handle these situations. Thank you, Mary. Um, we have about eight minutes left for, in our conversation. So the next couple, if we can, um, you know, uh, give a, a good uh, good answer, but a, a quick one so we can uh, be on time here. Um, Erica, you talked about you know you know having to fight the the loud minority here. What can parents do? You know, like you said, who maybe don't want to be you know put, put on headlines or be on YouTube and be all loud in school board meetings. What can what can those parents that want to fight against this kind of do? Well, they can still attend the school board meetings. They just don't need to act a fool when they do it, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, an easy way to start is by sending an email to your governance board. Um, and the funny thing is, is that, you know, you may go to these meetings alone, not really knowing, you know, who, who are, are other people who are like-minded like you. But once you leave, believe me, those parents who think like you are going to search for you and want to reach out to you so you can um, build some sort of camaraderie. Like, you know, a lot of us that have gotten together in my school district, it was, it's completely grassroots. It was just like, hey, I liked what you said. It was really powerful. Why don't you come and talk to us? You know, and um, so I would say the biggest thing is just don't act a fool, but I do want to um, real quick say that what Ryan and Janetta said is so powerful because you know, the books that are under attack right now aren't just LGBTQ books. They're um, books that are written by, by BIPOC, right? And so a lot of those books make pe people feel uncomfortable if you're not used to being part of a minority group, right? And, you know, let's say a straight boy reads George's book. Well, what a great thing, because maybe he could be empathetic to his friend or try to understand. And what happens is that these parents, because they've gone to our school board meetings, 
and they're complaining that their kid checked out. Let's say they ha they haven't complained about your book yet, George. But for example, they'll be like, "Oh, this book by this author, um, you know, not all boys wear blue, whatever. Like, you know, it's just bad. My son checked it out on accident, and it's like, well, maybe it wasn't an accident that your child checked it out. Like, that's what books give to the kids. Like me as a parent, I can't allow my fear." of who my child's going to be, direct what he, I want him to find a book where he can, well, first of all, that they read, but then that they can connect to, right? Like, that's what I want. I want them to connect and learn and be empathetic. And I would assume other parents would as well. Uh, same thing for you, Representative Wiener, you know, at this lawmaking level, what, what do you think needs to be done, you know, in the next, as we get into the, the next legislation in the legislature in a, in a year from now? Uh, well, uh, first, I really just want to um, put a giant exclamation point after everything Erica just said, because I was thinking along the same lines. As the parent of a white child, I want her to grow up learning empathy. And books are where we learned so much of that. I learned about the Black sharecropper experience from reading The Color Purple. I learned about growing up um, Hispanic in New Mexico from Bless Me Ultima. Like there are all of these books where we learn other people's stories and it helps us more encompass the world around us. And so I actually personally want to issue a challenge to white people who are watching this to also be present and supportive in these conversations because too often we are seeing a pretty big split in terms of who is participating on what side of the conversation. So if you are that white parent who wants your child to have access to diverse books, please speak up and we need you right now in those conversations. In terms of what should happen regarding legislation, um, I'll, I'll put, if I had a magic wand, I would repeal the critical race theory bill we just passed uh, because it is a mess and it complicates things for educators all around um, uh, in every way. Um, and it applies to every single part of the curriculum. And quite frankly, any single book that is being taught in schools could be challenged under that bill because it is written so poorly. Um, it literally says like anything that might make a student uncomfortable on the basis of their race or gender could be challenged. Um, and I've got <laughs> some notes for them on the literary canon and how some of that canon makes women feel. But, <laughs> but I don't think we're gonna repeal that bill. I think the best we can reasonably hope for is for legislators to get out of this, and we should. Some polling in November showed that fewer, well, two thirds of Texans don't trust legislators at all to decide which books are appropriate in schools. And we don't have the expertise. There's a few people like me who have been more involved in the writing education space, but I am far, far in the minority. So as legislators, we just need to not touch it. And I think where most of these fights are going to play out is in local school boards. So I want to challenge everybody here to be like Erica, show up at those meetings because the politicians are fundamentally beasts who respond to squeaky wheels. And if the squeaky wheel is the person yelling for books to be removed, people are going to start removing books. And just like Ryan said earlier, there are school boards anticipating those squeaky wheels and removing books right now. I wish some people in my district were calling the school board and going, you aren't removing books, are you? Uh, to try and head some of this off. So ask those questions of your school board, show up, be engaged, and shoot, even consider running for school board yourself if an opportunity presents in your community. Awesome, thank you so much, Representative. Um, and with that, we'll move to our audience uh, Q&A. Uh, we've curated uh, questions for this section. It'll be about 15 minutes. Uh, we received over hundreds of questions uh, for this event, so we won't be able to address everything, uh, but we encourage everyone to review the resources provided before, during, and after the event, as a lot of these questions will be answered in, in these resources. Um, so we'll, we're going to start with a question for Janetta and Ryan. Uh, do you feel that the loss of so many books in school libraries could have a long time effect on students? And Janetta, if you want to go first with that one. I, um, I do, and I have an example why. Um, I, okay, so this year um, for my AP Lang class, we read uh, the autobiography of Frederick Douglass. And it was, I mean, it kind of, it was really impactful on me because I think when we're in school, we like, we talk about 
slavery and it just feels very abstract like you understand that's a terrible thing but you don't really understand the impact that it had on somebody's soul um and then you read the words of like a living breathing human who under went through that kind of thing and it just it makes you understand better and it makes you realize that like that's not just history that was a person and so my worry is because i've seen some kinds of like civil rights type folks get targeted under like the guise of, oh, this is gonna make my kid feel guilty about being white, which no, no, it won't. Or if it does, like the, the, the more important thing here is that you're having civil rights stories be heard. Um, but I think there's a big um, danger here of not, um, of suppressing important stories that will, um, shape people's uh the way they view the world and that's good that's education ryan uh same question for you um i would just i would say that like um because a lot of people deal with like a lot of like issues in life and we can apply like that knowledge in books someone writes about their personal experiences and then puts them in books and are like are able to like share those experiences so if someone that has the same experiences or is going through the same experiences can read a book and look at it and be like hey look there's me inside of this book and are able to take advice and like knowledge to help them further um further what they're going through so like having like kind of like that recurring issue of like the like books not being able to be like shared and when they are when they are shared like the repercussions of like like people that put on them is uh yes sorry no you're totally fine uh thank you ryan um next one is going to be for george are there any actions that authors specifically can take to support librarians? Yeah, um, you know, it's it's tough uh, as an author. Um, you know, authors, we write books, we, we do storytelling, uh, but most authors are not trained to have to think that their book is going to be challenged in this way and think that their voice is going to have to extend outside of the story that they told. Um, and so one of the things that I do as an author, uh, prior to being an author, I was a journalist. Uh, and so confrontation was part of the game. So I, I had already been through all of the, the, the chops of media training and how to go on the attack and how to uh, counter attack when being attacked. Um, and so as an author, for me to support the librarians, uh, what the one thing I did was I knew I had a, the larger platform of all of the people who were making the most noise. And um, as state rep said, sometimes the, the, the person who could be the loudest will get the most attention. And I knew I could be a little bit louder. And so to pull the heat off of the librarians, I started tweeting about it and making it a national issue. I think this was a very local issue at first. And uh, I will never forget the day I, I tweeted, my book's been banned in eight states, it went viral. That next week was when criminal complaints got filed against me and the book. So I knew it triggered them to let them know like, oh, George's platform is really powerful. But what it does is when I go out there as an author who has the larger platform and I'm able to use my voice on a national level, it pulls the attention away from them because that's all they want. They want all the attention. So when I can suck the oxygen out of the attention they're trying to do, it takes the pressure off of those librarians from that micro moment because they didn't have to fight so hard nationally. They can't keep coming and attacking the librarians on such a small level. I think what it also does when we as authors speak up and we use our larger platforms to do so so it galvanizes students, it galvanizes communities. Uh, I have done TikToks to put information out there about how you start petitions, how you um, go to school board meetings and, and use your voice at school board meetings. Um, I think as the author, you know, the most powerful thing I can do is just continue to keep my voice out there too, um, and to galvanize students and also know that I, I support the librarians and that I have the librarians backs uh, when it comes to you know, their, their constant fight. 
Um, the librarians DM me a lot and we have a lot of private conversations. I have so many other things in the works that I'm going to do to continue to go against these bands. Um, but trust and believe that the librarians and the authors, we work very, very well together and we are a, a unified coalition. Uh, we just don't need it to make it look uh, as, as public. You know, I think the, the reason we are, in my opinion, we're, we're starting to really make some headway and, and win in several states is because we're moving in silence. And so we're going to continue to move in silence. But trust, just because we're moving silently doesn't mean we're not moving together. And uh, Representative Sweener, can you, this one's for you, can you offer advice for how to bolster our local officials when they start to feel the pressure of these very vocal groups? How can librarians be more proactive about interactions with elective officials? Um, I think what's important again is to show up and offer that support. Um, school districts have had a really hard two years and school board members in particular have felt that dramatically. Um, and the fights over books are just the newest iteration in that. Um, I don't know of a school board in my district where a member on that school board has not received death threats over the COVID issue. So that's the background that this issue is coming up in. Our school board members are really tired. Um, and I think are feeling a little conflict avoidant right now, even if they completely share our values around this. So making sure they have the tools they need to push back, whether um, as a librarian that's providing them detailed information about the books, making sure that you proactively reach out to make sure they understand what the processes are. Um, one of the most important things is that our school districts just follow whatever review processes they have in place. Every school district has that. And those processes generally leave the book on the shelf while the review is happening. When we get into trouble is when school districts try and go around those processes or change them in the middle of a high profile fight. So making sure they're aware of it, making sure the community is aware of it. And again, if you have other people that are friendly on this issue, want to make sure that books stay on the shelves, get them calling their school board members, showing up at meetings, et cetera. One thing I've heard again and again from school board members is all of these people will quietly tell me they support me on this issue, but no one will come say it in public. We have to say it in public if we're going to be successful in fighting this very activated minority of Texans who are wielding power pretty effectively right now. Uh, thank you for that representative. Um, the next one here is for Erica. Uh, from my experience in Indiana, those that want to censor are already activated. How can you get average Joes to be advocates when needed? That's a good question. Um, like I said, with us, it was completely grassroots and it was like, <laughs> You know, those wonderful positive parent boards on Facebook where you're like, your school district's parent board and, and you notice the people who kind of think like you or, you know, are, are answering um, about certain topics the same way you are, you kind of reach out to each other and then you find other people and it just kind of grows like that. Like, I'm sorry that, you know, there's not an actual formula. It's all just you know, putting your thoughts out there, finding people who think like you and actually contacting them. The beautiful thing is that if you're um, a little bit, if you have a little bit of social anxiety, like I tend to at times, that's the beautiful thing about like social media is that you could just like, <laughs> you can inbox someone like, hey, what's going on? As opposed to actually having to go and like talk to them. And so um, that's how our, our little group kind of started was just you know, I was at a school board meeting and they're like, who's that lady? And, you know, we all just kind of um, formed our own little like, okay, so what are we going to say at this meeting? And I also want to say that there's also a lot of burnout because I started hardcore a year and a half ago in this. And to be honest, as of, you know, probably this school year, I haven't been as active because a lot of the stuff that I um, fought for, like I was on committees, I reviewed the library books when they were under attack. I was part of a committee that the school district formed so parents can like review these books, which mind you, didn't follow the protocol that they were supposed to follow, right? It's just like Mary had mentioned. And so you do get burned out. Like I gave up so much of my time and my life last year and we did get what we wanted. We got the DEI policies in and we got a, a DEI officer. But the thing is, is I wanted to see how all this was going to play out this year. And um we're still here. So, <laughs> um, I, and I did say, and it's okay, it's okay to take those step backs, but there are people who think like you. It's just a matter of putting yourself out there and, you know, just introducing yourself. And even if it's you and one other person, 
eventually someone else is going to attach themselves to you because you're not the only one who thinks that way. And you're right, like the other group tend to um, be more organized because they have a lot of political people behind them. Like they already have established, um, you know, um, groups. And what's funny is we always like to joke is like, well, we're not like, we can't be like them because we actually like being around our families and we have full-time jobs. So <laughs> but that's just us being <laughs> like that. We notice that it's always the same people. We're like, how do they have time for this? But um, just find just find people who are like-minded like you. Oh, thank you, Erica. Uh, so next one is for Mary. How can we best handle other staff, other staff members such as non-librarians or library board members who do not who do not agree with everyone's freedom to read? One person noted a staff member who checks out and keeps a book they object to preventing others from reading. Well, um, I follow someone on Instagram who often says that um, facts don't require our approval. <laughs> so um, you know, I feel like. Um, just because someone doesn't agree with the right to read doesn't mean that it is not out there and it's not a right that someone has. Um, the Texas Library Association has got a statement on the uh, right to read and, and the fact that it must be protected. Um, so we have support um, in those areas. We also have um, a helpline that is staffed by members of our Intellectual Freedom Committee where anyone who needs support for these types of issues, for having these kinds of conversations can call and get connected up with someone who um, is maybe at their same level of uh, school or has uh, experienced the same situation. And so they can kind of talk through those things. Um, and then we also are developing um, a coalition. More information will be coming out about that in the next week or so. And um, so we hope to have everyone join our coalition um, that is gonna be promoting the right to read for everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we'll do it for our Q and A, our audience Q and A. As I mentioned before, we had hundreds of questions submitted for this event. Um, we can't get to all of them, uh, but we make sure to reference your the resources given uh, before, during, and after the event as well, as we're sharing websites and different kinds of resources where a lot of these questions will be answered. Um, I wanna thank again, each of our panelists for being here this evening and taking the time to talk about this issue, um, their thoughts and different perspectives. Um, at this time, uh, we're gonna have, uh, it's gonna go back to, George Kendall, editor and publisher of Booklist. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you all so much for that incredibly powerful and insightful discussion. Um, I, I would now like to introduce my colleagues, Deborah Caldwell Stone and Kristen Peacol from the ALA Office of Intellectual Freedom. Deborah Caldwell Stone is the director of ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom and executive director of the Freedom to Read Foundation. For nearly two decades, she has helped libraries, librarians, and trustees address a wide range of intellectual freedom issues, including the censorship of books, library law and policy, and the privacy of library users' records. And Kristen Peacol is the assistant director at the Office for Intellectual Freedom. She is a former YA librarian from Wisconsin and a lifelong Green Bay Packers fan who happens to live in Chicago Bears country. She is the author of Beyond Banned Books, Defending Intellectual Freedom Throughout Your Library, published by ALA Editions in 2019. Thank you so much for being here, Deborah and Kristen. Uh, thank you, George. Thank you for having us here today. Uh, and I, I almost don't know what to add to the panelists' wonderful insights and the great information that they've shared. Uh, what I can tell you that 2021 was a banner year for censorship. Uh, we're still working on the numbers for 2021, but I can tell you that we're certainly going to triple the numbers from 2020, which were fairly low because of the pandemic, and we're certainly going to double uh, the numbers from 2019, where we had 377 challenges for the entire 12-month period. 
Um, so we're looking forward to sharing those numbers and the top 10 most challenged book list with you during National Library Week, which will be starting up on April 4th. Um, what I'd like to do, however, is turn this over to Kristen, who is uh, really an intellectual freedom hero. She's fought in the trenches. Uh, she fought her own uh, set of book banners in West Bend. Almost, It's almost 10 years ago now, or more than 10 years. Uh, but she's going to talk about all the resources we have for library workers uh, available here at ALA to help you address censorship in your libraries and, and to uh, work with community members on fighting censorship and reporting censorship. Kristen? Thank you, Deborah. Um, it has been such an honor to listen to the panelists today. I cannot tell you. Every day I talk on the phone and by email with all types of library workers all over the country. And I hope some of them are able to join this event today and hear your words and your inspiration. The panelists have just been amazing. As a former librarian uh, who has gone through a challenge myself, the most courageous thing I've ever witnessed were the teens who spoke out honestly and directly about the value of the books to their lives and to their futures. It's not easy right now. Um, it's not easy for librarians to find the courage and strength to keep fighting a battle that feels like it is doing nothing but growing bigger and more hateful. I don't always like to use battle imagery when I talk about experiences, but sometimes it fits. And I think this is one of those times. Librarians and teachers are getting hit and wounded from different people and different issues. They're being attacked at work and on social media. They're being attacked by their administrators and by their patrons. Their expertise is questioned. Their motives are questioned. They're being called out in the media and in public media, public meetings by name and accused of the most vile crimes. This is not an easy time for people right now. And it breaks my heart. Um, in my role at ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom, we try to offer support. Uh, we listen and we give them a space, those who call us to be honest and angry and sometimes to find humor in the situation. We try to offer a place um, for people to vent and to find compassion, to find a place that doesn't judge. Um, I often try to find tangible resources that we can help give them a sense of direction, whether it's a, a Q&A, talking points, um, references from the Intellectual Freedom Manual, or a recording of a webinar, or leading them to someone else who's had experience. And I try to validate what they're doing and remind them again of the people that they are serving and why they joined this amazing profession. I love what um, George M. Johnson said earlier in the hour. Um, you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. And while OIF and a lot of others are here, if you need to get ready when a challenge happens, we also try to proactively lay a foundation that allows library workers and their institutions to be ready. So with education, resources, and local advocacy, advocacy, you can be that much stronger and that much more ready when it happens to you. If we've learned nothing from this time that we're in right now, it's that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when a challenge happens in your community. The resources that we provide um, are written and adopted by ALA members all over the country. They are crafted with a lens to what we hear library workers experiencing. Rural librarians, urban librarians, school librarians, public, academic, and special. And that's why it's so important that each and every one of us reports challenges and to continue to talk about censorship when we hear about it. I can't express enough how important it is to not ignore it, not be silent about censorship. The voices and the information in books are so important. Authors like George, authors like all the others that we see on the banned books list. But the readers, the readers who need these books are also very, very important. 
I know it's hard to stand up. Many of us don't always like the public attention. It takes courage. But even just reporting it to OIF, OIF, we can listen. We're the original hotline. We're glad to see so many others that are helping out and doing such great work and working together in coalitions. OIF keeps, their con keeps our conversations completely confidential. If you can't publicly fight against these, we understand. We can offer professional and emotional support. Sometimes in situations, we can't always retain the materials in the libraries. We hope we can always fight banned books, but we know that it's happening. We know that these books are getting taken off the shelves. But hopefully we can continue to not only retain our jobs, but to advocate in our positions for the principles of intellectual freedom and reading new and diverse stories and being there, being in the libraries for our students and for our community to fight again another day. So as LeVar Burton so perfectly put it the other day on, uh, on uh, The Daily Show, read banned books. Thank you, Deborah and Kristen. As a reminder, a resource guide and a link to today's recording will be sent to all registrants in follow-up communications tomorrow. This brings us to the end of today's program. We'd like to once again thank our panelists, Brian, George, Janetta, Ryan, Erica, Mary, Representative Zwiener, and the Office for Intellectual Freedom. This event would not have been possible without our host, the Texas Library Association, and our sponsor, the School and Library Marketing Team at Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. Many thanks for your support, planning, and participation. And one final thank you to all librarians, library workers, and educators for your hard work and efforts to support the freedom to read. This concludes today's webinar. <laughs>